thousand times before. To the time of the Horadrim, who faced the Lord of Destruction. And imprisoned him within the Soul Stone. This is the brutal, untold truth of Talrash's full torture and what happened to him over the years at the hands of Bale, which was explored in the book Tales from the Herodric Library during the short story The Tomb of Talrasha by Brian Evanson and illustrated by Josh Tallman. I beheld the vision of a great man, the mage Talrasha. You were there too, Tyrion, I remember seeing you in my dream. His brethren had cornered a great demon, Baal, Lord of Destruction, who had been set loose upon the world. They attempted to imprison the demon within a sacred stone. Yet when their attempts failed, Talrasha selflessly volunteered to contain the demon within himself completing the prison. He instructed his brethren to bind him within a tomb, buried under the sand, there to wrestle with the demon for all eternity. I must ask again, are you certain? Said a voice behind him. Talrasha stared at the binding stone that Tyriel had helped them shape and etch with runes of containment. Talrasha had captured Bale in the shard of the Amber Soul Stone after a long and arduous battle, but the Herodrum knew the containment of the prime evil would be short-lived unless the shard was combined with a human. Within moments, Talrasha would be inextricably bound to the Shard, and by extension, to the very prime evil he and his brethren had sought so desperately to destroy. The voice addressing Talrasha was that of Zoltan Kool. He'd asked this question, first as Tyriel had led them through the subterranean tunnels and into these burial chambers of long-dead kings. He'd asked yet again when they begun to shape the Binding Stone and forge the unbreakable chains, and now, before it was too late, he was asking a third time. I am certain, Talrasha said, and by saying it, he found that he was. His whole life had been dedicated to justice and light. If he were to balk now, millions would die at Bale's hands, playthings to his greed for destruction. Better that one man should perish than the whole world suffer, even if that one man happened to be him as Tyriel directed the Herodrum in affixing the chains and the chants that would make the binding eternal, Talrasha took in a deep breath. This would be his last moment of peace before a half-life of eternal struggle. He felt the manacles tighten around his wrists, felt his arms and legs stretch tight. He closed his eyes and uttered a silent prayer for the eternal light to give him strength to withstand the difficult path he had chosen. When he'd opened his eyes again, Tyriel was there, looming just before him, the glowing shard held delicately between his fingers. I am ready, said Talrasha. Tyriel nodded once. So, so be it, he said, and drove the shard deep into Talrasha's being. The pain was enormous. He immediately, he was writhing in agony, the fire in his chest searing and unrelenting as he felt his body being transformed into a prison for the terrible bale. He cried out, gnashing his teeth as his Herodrum brethren and Tyriel stood motionless before him, watching. Help me, a part of him wanted to say. The pain is too great. I was wrong. He bit down on his tongue until his mouth was full of blood, his body shaking and rattling in the chains, the presence of Bale uncomfortable and menacing, so much love of destruction, and this, this agony, this Evil would be his only companion for not mere days or weeks or months, but years and years. He felt Bale pushing at his mind and body, scouring for weaknesses, shaking the very foundations of his soul. His brother slowly turned away and filed out. Then came the sound of the stone door grating closed and the chanting from the other side as it was sealed with runes and Tal Rasha was left all alone in the flickering light, writhing, wriggling, 
unable to catch his breath, hardly able to think, struggling to remember he was human. Only he wasn't alone exactly. Why have your brethren abandoned you? Whispered Bale. Talrasha tried not to listen. Why have they left you behind? If they were truly your brothers, they never would have done so. My brothers and I, we look out for one another. True brothers do. Are your brothers so false? There <clears throat> was no choice, said Tal Rasha, panting as he forced out the words. There is always a choice. How is it after all you've done to serve them? They allowed you to sacrifice yourself. Talrasha could see Zoltan now in his mind's eye, as he'd made the decision to sacrifice himself. Was that a flicker of satisfaction he glimpsed? Before it was quickly hidden away, had this been what Zoltan wanted all along? <laughs> Zoltan Cool is hardly as pure as he allows you and the others to believe. Talrasha groaned. No, he said, I won't listen to you. But whether he listened now or not, it was too late. The idea was already planted in his mind. Why had Zoltan done nothing to try to stop him? He could remember the others, the horror and shock on their faces as they realized what their leader had agreed to do. But Zoltan's face had been blank, expressionless, hadn't it? Or was this all wrong? Was he being forced to misremember in a way that Bale's voice resonated in his skull, disrupting his thoughts, sending them swirling away? The others protested. But did he? Did he? He was losing his footing again, seeing only Zoltan's cruel face as he stayed silent, while the others tried to keep Talrasha from taking the burden upon himself. He had never asked Talrasha to offer up his own life, but, but he never volunteered himself either. Zoltan had known that if he waited long enough, if he directed him just enough, Talrasha would take the burden upon himself, just as he had desired. But wait, no, was he remembering it correctly? It didn't seem right, but surely it had just happened. Surely it was fresh in his mind. That demonic voice again, more insistent now. Zoltan Cool came up with the accursed idea. He could have volunteered himself at any time. He never did. He wanted you to leave the Order so that he would become the head of the Order. This was an elaborate ploy to take your place. No, it wasn't true. It couldn't be. It was not Zoltan Cool he should doubt, but this whispering, lying voice. Bale, be gone, demon, he cried. I command thee to part. For a moment, there was silence in his head. No whispering, no other voice, though his body continued to contort and struggle. And then, starting low and rising, he heard Bale's awful laughter. <laughs> You fool, I cannot be banished or dismissed. Your very body is the place of my banishment. Our fates are bound together now. You cannot rid yourself of me. <laughs> he chuckled again maliciously. His voice, when he spoke again, was low and deadly. Or oh, perhaps I should say, you cannot escape me. The demon stretched, and Tal Rasha felt needles within his skin as the demon again tested the bounds of his prison. <coughs> he cried out, and his mouth filled with blood. His vision grew blurred and dark. He was panting, exhausted. Would that I could simply destroy you, said Bale. That I could trample your body into a slick of blood and bring about your annihilation, as I done with so many. I am not well disposed to patience, particularly when I have no choice. And now, even with his eyes closed, 
Talrasha felt that he could see Bale's cruel mind staring back at him out of the darkness. I cannot destroy you all at once, Bale said. And so I will destroy you bit by bit. I will take one part of your mind and crush it. Then another, then another, until you are reduced to nothing. Until you are less than nothing. An empty shell. And then I will crack you open and crawl out of you. Talrasha opened his eyes, but Bale's face still remained, marring his vision like a smear. What have I condemned myself to? He asked himself, but he already knew. Despite his love of the light, despite his countless deeds upholding justice, in order to save the world, he'd sentenced himself to a living hell. He was filled with infinite regret. A regret that he knew was likely to last forever. But haven't I already been here forever? As suddenly as the vision had begun, for indeed a vision was what it had been, he could see now that it fizzled away. None of this just happened. By Talrasha's estimation, he'd already been suffering for a few years, but what was a, but what was a mere handful of years in the face of eternity? He looked down and saw his struggling body, emaciated and barely human. He felt the eternal hunger that had been with him nearly as long as he could remember. The thirst that left him forever parched and always just a hair's breadth shy of death. His body struggled, yanking at its bonds. It both was and wasn't his body now, he knew, and both was and wasn't the one struggling. In a flash, he knew that the scene with Zoltan had been fed to him by Bale, a subtle reworking of what had actually happened, with Bale keeping nearly everything the same while nevertheless introducing shades of doubt and fear, making him mistrust himself and his brethren to weaken Talrasha's mind even further and break him apart piece by piece, just as the Lord of Destruction had promised to do. But at least this time, Talrasha had seen through it. <clears throat> you cannot fool me with your illusions, demon. And yet I have fooled you with this same illusion time and time again, mage. Each time it takes you a little longer to understand that it is an illusion. Your mind is crumbling, and soon it shall be reduced to ash, and I will be free. No, thought Talrasha, you're lying. But deep inside him, he knew it was true that he had been through this before and yet had forgotten. Bale laughed. <laughs> Another piece of you gone. There you go, grain by grain, dispersed into nothingness. You Herodrum with your so-called love of justice, believing that knowledge will be enough to save you. How quaint. Just because you recognize what is happening to you doesn't mean that you can prevent it from happening. He opened his eyes unto darkness. Silence. It took a moment for him to realize where he was. What a terrible dream, he thought. The light of the waning crescent moon through his cell window was so dim that he could see almost nothing at all. He groped along the floor beside his pallet, until he found the earthenware cup and raised it to his lips, drinking the tepid water. But strangely enough, as soon as he'd drunk the water and set the cup down, he felt thirsty again. What time was it? Early, no doubt. Too early to be getting up. But after such a dream, how could he sleep? No, better to rise and light a candle and get to work. He had his history to record, the true story of how he had been chosen by Tyriel to be the leader of the Herodrum, how he had sacrificed himself to save the world, and how, miraculously, his life had been returned to him, his glory had been returned to him, so that now he was again among the Herodrum, the defenders of truth and light, and dedicated to a monastic life of contemplation and wisdom. He rose from his pallet once more and slipped on his robe, then fumbled through the darkness, hands outstretched until his fingers touched the back of his chair. He settled onto it and pulled it closer to the crude wooden table, 
that served him as a desk, then cast his hands carefully over its surface, past the ever-present stack of books, brushing the feathered ends of the quills until he found the candle, its sides stippled with wax drippings. He mumbled a simple spell, and it sprang alight. He arranged a blank half-sheet of fool's cap before him. Choosing a quill from the cup that held them, he dipped the pen in the ink and began to write. I found myself, he wrote in the depths. I was breaking, but not yet broken. I clung to what I had learned, to the truths that Tyrael had revealed to me, and hoped that the bedrock of this great knowledge would be enough to allow me to survive until my fellow Herodrum figured out a way to rescue my body, a way to substitute something else as a prison for bail. Surely Tyrael would find some means to bring the shards of the Amber Soulstone back together, or perhaps the means to carve another prison from what remained of the World Stone. I had continued to hope, I knew, and I must not, above all, give away to despair. Reaching the end of the page, he drew back, waiting for the ink to dry before he added it to the stack of finished pages at his elbow. He blew lightly on the words to facilitate this, but as he did so, the letters seemed to twist and move, dancing madly in the candle's flame. He shook his head, but the words were still moving, little rivulets of ink darting across the page. Frowning, he peered closer, rereading what he had written. Only a few years into his captivity, Torbelos, Lord of Destruction, esteemed spawn of one of the primary heads of Tathamet, had broken the will of the meddlesome mage. The once proud Talrasha had become a shadow of his former self, his mind reduced to a residue of impulses that Bael could shape as putty to his will. However, Tyrael's magic could not yet be defeated. Though, Tyr though Talrasha's heart had become weakened and diseased, it, combined with the Shard, still held Bael imprisoned. And yet, it was his jailer who suffered more than Bael himself. For each year he kept Bael imprisoned, it felt as though Talrasha suffered in the burning hells for a thousand years. Soon, Talrasha's mind would be gone, and his body would be entirely subject to Bael's will. All the great Bale would have to do was be patient. But patience did not come easily to Bale. Fortunately, he had his jailer upon which to take out his frustrations. Talrasha felt his blood grow chill. He reached for the page to tear it in two, but as he did, he saw that his reaching hand was dark red and scaly, and terminated in sharp grey claws. He lifted it to his face and stared at it, then pushed back the sleeve of his robe. There too, the skin was red and scaled. He reached up to his face, felt the way his mouth puckered strangely, fingered the tips of the long fangs. His hand travelled upwards, touched the curled horns that jutted from the crown of his head. No! He said aloud. It can't be! He was imagining things. This couldn't be happening. But then again, how had he escaped? Was that not impossible as well? Unless, perhaps, he had sold his soul and ended up giving in to darkness. Had it gone so far? Was this why he had become a demon? At first, no one responded to his pounding at the locked door. And then, finally, as he paused to catch his breath between shouts, at a distance, a door opening and shutting. Hello, he called. Please, help me. Nobody answered. After a time, he heard the sound of footsteps drawing nearer, then nearer still, finally stopping just outside his door. Who is it? He asked. Open this door at once. I will not open the door, said a voice that he recognized as Sultan Cools. His second in command, the very person he had feared would take over leadership of the Order when he'd been left alone to struggle with Bale in the tomb. His betrayer. I command it, Talrasha said and waited, but still the door did not open. At last, Zoltan spoke, his voice tired, exhausted as if this was a conversation he had far too many times. We have done what we can for you, said Zoltan. We have, as requested, provided you with writing implements so that you can record all that has happened to you. 
We have given you every comfort possible. We have made of your necessary solitude a life of contemplation. Perhaps one day you may be released. Once we know that we can trust you again. Talrasha felt rage well up within him. How could those who had once served him have the appalling temerity to believe they could control him so? He pounded again on the door. Release me! He cried, Cure me of this curse! From the other side of the door, Zoltan's voice remained calm. Even if I so desired, I could not. The door has been meticulously bound shut. It would take all the Herodrum working together to remove the runes of binding. As for your curse, you brought it upon yourself. Return to your desk, record your history, share your wisdom with us, slide the papers under the door, we will gather them, read them, consult among ourselves. Perhaps one day, when the time is right, we will release you. This is unjust, said Talrasha. By holding me, you are breaking your vow to serve justice. But Zoltan said nothing in response. As Tal Rasha listened, he heard footsteps move slowly away, and then, finally, in the distance, the sound of a door shutting. Not knowing what else to do, he returned to his desk. He examined his scaly hand. How had this come to happen? He reached for a quill, and when he picked one up, it became engulfed in flame. But it only felt comfortably warm in his hand. Just like home, he thought. Almost without realizing what that implied. Shall I try again? He wondered. And then, because he did not know what, if anything else he could do, he lifted the pen and began to write. I am not sure what has happened to me. He wrote with the burning pen. The air filled with a pungent odor, and he realized that he was writing not on paper, but on parchment made from the skin of an animal. Or rather, he was sure, though he was not sure how he was sure. Not an animal, but the skin of a human. A perfect recording surface for a demon such as myself, he thought. Is this real? He wrote. Am I still dreaming? He found himself staring out the window. It was, he saw, still dark outside. It was impossible to see anything except the same sliver of moon. Once morning came, perhaps, he could leap from the window and escape that way. With his free hand, he reached towards the opening, but before he could cross its surface, a bluish fire began to play over it, and he found he could not touch it. Of course, the Herodrum were careful and efficient. They would have left nothing to chance. A scratching sound distracted him. He glanced down and saw that while he'd been lost in thought, his clawed hand had been idly doodling. There was a face there now, crudely drawn, but nonetheless, a face. He peered at it, looking at it more closely. It looked familiar. He stared, and then by impulse, began to redraw a few lines, reconnect others, all to the accompaniment of the smell of burning flesh. He still couldn't quite place the face, until suddenly, abruptly, he could. It was the face of Tal Rasha. That's my face, he realized with a start. That's who I really am. He reached up and touched his head and found the horns were no longer there. He looked back at the drawing, but that was gone too. The whole desk was gone, and the cell too was fading around him. All that remained was the flickering light of the candle. But it was not from a candle any longer. It was the flickering light that illuminated the tomb. He was back to where he always had been, bound to the stone, twisting and turning in endless combat with Bale. But he knew where he was, knew who he was. He had not been broken. Yet, Bale gave a low chuckle. <laughs> you have failed to break me again, panted Talrasha. Bale hissed. I am hollowing you out from the inside. With every failure, I come closer to succeeding. With every success, you come closer to your final failure. You are a worthy opponent, Talrasha said. But I shall continue to triumph. 
You, on the other hand, said Bale, are a fool and a waste of my time. How many years had it been? One? Two? A decade? A century? He did not know, nor did he know how much longer he could hold out. An impossible task, it turned out, resisting a prime evil. Bale was becoming more inventive, manipulating and pushing his mind more and more effectively, making him more malleable. In the end, he knew, he would only be a hollow version of what he had once been, not even close to human. He was already well on the way there. The last vision had been as bad as any. Each time Bale altered his reality, the demon watched carefully for what upset Talrash the most, made careful note of it, and amplified it in whatever came next. You will never be free, he told himself. In the end, you will collapse. But even once you do, the binding will still hold. He will still be imprisoned within you. You will still have saved the world. If you are to give in eventually, came Bale's voice from within his head. Why not give in now? Why not give in now? He wondered. It would bring the torture to a stop. His body tensed and contorted, squirmed. But it had been happening for so long, so many years now, that he almost no longer noticed it. The pain, a constant scream that never dissipated. His vocal cords, long gone raw. His hunger, perpetual. His thirst, too. A true hell. Why not give in? Why not end it? But would it really end? Could he be sure? Once he gave in, perhaps it would simply allow Bale to make things worse. He writhed, breathed through his teeth, he bit his tongue, but whatever blood had been in him was mostly dried up. It came torpidly and didn't last long. <laughs> How much longer can I survive? Something was nagging at him. What was it? Something felt different. Something was different. And then he realized one of his hands was no longer restrained. The chain that bound it had somehow come loose. It was impossible. And yet, no, not impossible, just improbable. There were, he realized, circumstances where it might just be possible. A syllable mispronounced or skipped when the binding spell was uttered, perhaps by only one of the Horodrum. Not enough to be noticed in the chorus of voices by Tyriel, but just enough to introduce a subtle flaw. A weakness that would over time cause the rune to slowly fail. Yes, it was just possible. Perhaps that, combined with his increasingly diminished physical body, had been enough to allow him to slip free of one of his chains, even while the other remained implacably in place. His hand could now reach out and grab the shard that was in his chest. He could even tug it out if he so chose. How tempting that was. To be free of this torment once and for all. To allow his body, so long tortured, to rest. Perhaps even to die. Hadn't he suffered enough? How could any mortal be asked to endure torment such as this? And yet, he had promised to save the world. He had sacrificed himself willingly. If he were to go back on this promise, all that he had sacrificed would have been for naught. No, he couldn't give up. And now that he'd added one more burden to those already heaped upon him, he must not let Bale know that his arm was unchained. Must not, in fact, think about it at all. If he did, Bale would wrest control of Tal Rasha's own hand, use it to tug the golden shard free, and release him from his captor. He felt despair welling up in him. How long could he keep his secret? One slip, and it was over. One slip, and he would betray the world. Something is different, Bale thought. The arrogant mage, the worm, had become cagey. The vermin was hiding something. <laughs> Amusing that he thought he could keep it a secret from him. Tor Baelos, who had millennia of interactions with demons and angels and humans to tell him when someone was trying to deceive him. Bale was sick of being trapped here, with this uptight mage with his principles and his values, who had somehow convinced himself that Sanctuary would be a better world if it stayed always the same, stagnant, unchanging. Bah! 
sneered Bale. What fun was that? And what fun was this mage? Both of them knew that he couldn't hold out forever, and Bale knew too that someday something would change, that the idea that he could be bound for eternity in a place like this was part and parcel of the naive belief that things wouldn't change. But things did change, and he would get out. And once he was out, he would pop this arrogant little major's head like a grape. Then he would devastate this world and everything in it. Kill everything he saw, growing stronger with each act of slaughter. He had a lot of mayhem to catch up on. But what was different now? What was this runt hiding from him? He worked his way into the man's puny mind and found him thinking obsessively about the fact that he was trapped here, that there was no escape. (sighs) That was nothing new. The mage had been playing intermittently with this one putrid thought for years and years now, turning it this way and that, examining it from every angle. But something about it this time gave Bale pause. Shortly, he realized what it was. Tal Rasha never thought with such obsession about his plight. He thought about it, true, but not obsessively. What had shifted? And then it occurred to Bale. He was trying not to think about something else. He pushed farther in. The man's mind was so easy to penetrate. Its hallways, regular and straight and boring. Nothing ever dynamic here. That Tyriel had ever thought of this man as a worthy vessel to contain him was incredible to Bale. But then again, the idiot Archangel had always underestimated him and his brothers and would no doubt continue to do so. He pushed his way through Talrasha's mind, looking for dark corners, places where things might be hidden. There were one of two things, moments from his childhood that he kept hidden, perhaps even from himself. Nothing of real consequence, but things Bale filed away as fodder for potential inclusion in future visions. And then, suddenly, there it was, a newly patched wall, so to speak, Water still damp, so obvious, hidden in plain sight. It was always a pleasure to make a wall collapse. He prodded on it with his forelegs, and it crumbled inward, and there it was. At first, Bale couldn't believe it, but as he sorted through Talrasha's reasoning, slowly drawing it out of the man bit by painful bit, he began to believe that, yes, it was possible. The fools! They couldn't even cast a binding spell correctly. And yes, Talrasha's worries were correct. He still couldn't escape from the binding, but Bale now could. All he needed was to take control of Talrasha's hand and... But the mage proved remarkably resistant. He had clearly been preparing for this eventuality for some time. How infuriating. If he was out of this prison, Bale would simply tear the brat's head from his shoulders and be done with him. They struggled back and forth, with Bale doing all he could to assert his will, until finally, exhausted, Tal Rasha's guard momentarily slipped. It was all Bale needed. He rushed in and took control of the hand, and a moment later, it had closed around the shard that Tyriel had jammed deep within Talrasha's flesh. Talrasha screamed and fought to regain control, but it was already too late. The shard had already been withdrawn and cast aside. Bale was free. It was exhilarating being released after all these years. He rushed for the exit. Surely there was some sort of alarm trigger, which would mean that it was only a matter of time before that busybody Tyriel arrived. Hearing behind him the anguished cries of the collapsed and helpless Tal Rasha, Bale nearly doubled back to finish him off. But even he knew that would be reckless. He had to flee while he still had the chance. Another day, Tal Rasha. Bell cried, <laughs> cackling with 
glee, he would find his brothers, and together they would come back and make short work, first of Tal Rasha and then of the High Heavens. There would be time enough to track down this ruined husk of a man. For now, let him stay bound to the stone, dying his slow and painful death. Bael had to use all his strength to move the stone that blocked the tomb. Funny, he thought. I would have thought they would have bound this place in as well. He remembered that from the nightmare he'd given Talrasha a few years before, but perhaps that detail had been his own addition to the story. He had changed so many small details in the vision he had manufactured that it was sometimes hard to remember what had been real. The block rolled away, grinding against the stone, and he stepped into the tunnel beyond. He rushed through it, deserted as it was. He passed other tombs, and now he could hear behind him the sound of Tyriel rising, beckoning after him, searching for him. A good thing that Bale hadn't indulged himself and gone back to slaughter Tal Rasha. If he had, he'd be in the heat of battle right now. And suddenly, there it was. The exit to the outside world. Bale swung the double doors open and rushed out the other side, only to find the inside of the same tomb. What? There was no outside. How could this be? What sort of curse was this? And where was Tyriel? He could no longer hear the sounds of the Archangel's imminent arrival. He pushed through the doors again and found himself outside at last, but surrounded by... What could those be? Cows? But bipedal and carrying pole arms? What fresh hell was this? They rushed forth, mooing at him, and with a flick of his forelegs, he sent a wave of ice to mow them down. They were nothing, easily defeated, and yet they kept coming and coming and coming. Troubled, he stepped back through the doors to gather himself and think, and found himself in the tomb again. When, after a moment, he opened the doors again, he found himself looking out upon the inverse mirror of the tomb. Once again, there was no outside. Did I miss my chance? Which way should I go? Back the way I came or into this mirror image? He hesitated. It was not like the Lord of Destruction to hesitate, and yet he did. And then he plunged into the mirror image of the tomb. Slowly, with increasing dread, he crept back the way he had come following the same path but in reverse, into a backward version of the world. He came at last to the rock he had rolled aside. He hesitated there, not sure that he wanted to see what was on the other side, but at last, not knowing what else to do, he passed through. There, on the other side, still perfectly chained, still impeccably attached to the binding stone, was Tal Rasha. The shard was still anchored deep within his flesh. His body was still contorted in agony as his features flickered back and forth between his own human face and the monstrous face of Bale. Bale howled with frustration to have been made to think he was free and he had never been free at all. To be bested, he, by a mere mortal, if only for a few moments. What would his brothers say if they could bear witness to what had happened? And upon thinking that, he found himself not standing observing Tal Rasha, but back within the crystal, back within Tal Rasha, his fleshy prison. Trapped, despite his pain, despite his state of perpetual agony, Tal Rasha smiled. He had, for once, given Bale some of his own medicine. The victory was pyrrhic and fleeting, but he had managed to preserve a tiny piece of himself. Perhaps he could hold on to sanity for a little longer after all. But then, within him, Bale began to rage. His smile quickly extinguished. Talrasha began to scream with pain. <coughs> My companion drew in the dank, cold air of the tomb. It seemed to strengthen him. I stood in the doorway between light and dark. 
what was left of my sanity implored me not to enter. But that voice was just a whisper now. As we worked our way down deeper and deeper into the crypt, I began to see a change in my companion. He seemed to be gaining strength. I could hardly see in the gloom, but my companion seemed to know the way. We came at last to a great hall. had been losing what was left of his humanity. He moved with demonic speed and then... then you appeared. Stop! Beast contained herein shall not be set free, not even by you. Take the stone and run! 